Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am back with another interesting topic and again on Kafka. Uh, pretty pretty hot topic uh, if you talk about the Kafka ecosystem which is KSQL DB uh, or KSQL. We'll get to it and to do that uh, we have Mathias with us. Uh, uh, we did a podcast on exactly one semantics how it works. We did a deep dive. It was very insightful. Um, and so if you haven't watched that episode, please do take a look. So uh, welcome, Matthias. Thanks a lot for joining us again. And uh, yeah, let's start with a bit introduction about yourself and um, a little bit about your experience with KSQL DB. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for having me. I'm glad that I did not mess up the first time, so I'm allowed to be back here on the show. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So, so yeah, I mean, I mean, my background is I'm, I'm a, I'm a software engineer at, at Confront at the moment. Um, I've been with Confront for, for a couple of years, originally worked on Kafka streams. Um, and then I think two years back, uh, the focus shifted completely to KSQL DB, but I was involved in KSQL. That was the pre-product of KSQL DB and KSQL DB for, for a couple of years already. Mm. because KSQL DB and also KSQL basically use Kafka streams internally. Mm -hmm. And so working on Kafka streams, what basically provides the runtime for KSQL DB. Um, I was always a little bit involved. Um, I worked a little bit on our, uh, on our language evolution and SQL dialect. It is not standard SQL because we do streaming data. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm still, still working on KSQL DB. It's an exciting topic. Yeah. Very exciting. And, uh... It's so cool to have you back. I mean, the first episode was definitely very insightful. I've got a lot of interesting feedback. Uh, it was very useful. So let's start with the basics again. Uh, so when we say KSQL, you also mentioned that there is, it was, you know, previously called KSQL and now it is called KSQL DB. So I want to ask you two questions in a, in a combined manner, like what is KSQL DB, KSQL? And what is the like history a little bit of, you know, why it was renamed to KSQL DB and what was the difference? Can you give us a little background? Yeah, absolutely. So, so originally, um, set started, I think in 2017 or something like that. Um, when, when Confluence said, well, we, we do have Kafka streams and Kafka streams is a great API for child mm -hmm. developers to write yeah. their, their stream processing applications against Kafka. Mm -hmm. But, well, you know, if you only have Java, then, of course, there's a whole huge ecosystem of people using other languages or people who might not even be programmers. Uh, and we would like to enable them to also, you know, do stream processing. Yeah. And, and SQL is obviously the, the, the lingua franca of stream processing. So the choice was to say, well, let's start with an SQL for Kafka streams, basically. That allows you to say instead of writing a Java program, I write an SQL statement. Mm -hmm. We compile it down into a Kafka Streams program and execute it for you. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing we do. Um, and that basically gives us two advantages. We don't have to re-implement Kafka Streams in like ten different languages. I mean, and maybe we do it anyway at some point. But I mean, it's a huge effort to re-implement it in Python and Go and you know, you name it. Yeah. Um, or we just say no. We actually just do SQL. Um, and then everybody who is not using Java, they can still integrate with KSQL DB. We offer a REST endpoint. You, know, you just submit your queries. Mm -hmm. You deploy KSQL DB as a server system. So it's not like a client anymore, like Kafka Streams. Um, and you write your, your application in any language you want and just integrate with the KSQL DB cluster or with the KSQL cluster. And then you're done. And so back in the days, we just called it KSQL. Um, and the idea was really say, you know, instead of having a Java API, we give you an SQL dialect to write Kafka Streams application. And that was really the focus. Okay. Interesting. And then maybe two years later or something like that, I can't remember the exact timeline. The idea was to say, well, actually it would be even better to really say, we don't want to have this like, you know, sin, it wasn't really sin anymore, but it's sin SQL layer on top of Kafka Streams. But we actually would like to, to build what we, what we said called a streaming database. Hmm. So basically making one more step instead of just saying, hey, compile down Kafka Streams application, gives the user a, a more database-like experience. Okay. And then the rebranding started with, with KSQLDB. And, and the main features that was added in the first release 
was what we call in KSQL pull queries or what is called in Kafka streams interactive queries. Okay. So if you, you write your Kafka streams application, you can have state, right? Mm -hmm. And using Kafka streams, you can use interactive queries to query those state stores. And so the idea was to say, well, if you have already KSQL and we have streams and tables in our SQL, mm -hmm. why do we not allow people to query those tables directly, yeah. like in a database? Mm -hmm. And this is actually built on the interactive queries API of Kafka streams. And now KSQL DB comes with like multiple query types, not just those what we call persistent queries that are basically okay. Kafka streams application running in the background doing data crunching, but you can now more interactively say, hey, give me the current rows of the table and it just scans the rocks DBs, you know, in the background and just returns the result. And it's a, a more like database experience what you're what you're used from from other databases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I have some questions on that, like how things are working in the background, but we'll get to it later. Uh, I want to ask you, um, why why SQL? Like why, uh, like there are so many other technologies as well. They are, they use SQL as a interface. Uh, what in your view is the reason that SQL is so popular? Uh, like even uh, like Kafka ecosystem has the SQL interface to query data on Kafka. Yeah, I mean, if, if you really go, back in history, I think the big advantage of SQL is really, if especially for relational database systems, that you completely decouple the execution and, and the business logic. Mm -hmm. Because you have this declarative language, right? Yeah. And so you just say, what do I want to have? But I don't need to worry about how it's executed. Mm. And then you, especially in relational databases, you know, like the Oracle, the IBM, the SQL servers, mm -hmm. you have very, very, very sophisticated Mm -hmm. uh, query optimizers, yeah, um, and and that just makes it very accessible to to a broad majority of people, mm -hmm. um, and so that was also the reason why we picked it because it's kind of you know easy accessible, decouple it, don't worry about uh, the, the needy grits about you know how it's executed and stuff like that, yeah, um, and just give very very easy access, yeah. and that people okay. tap into the data stored in Kafka. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So it's basically the idea is to so there's a lot of data in Kafka, of course, and we we have some streaming applications, streaming use case on top of that. So we use Kafka streams for that. And now we just want to give it a feel of a database. So it's it, there is data, there's streaming data, like new data is coming up. And you just want to query like a database. That's the whole idea, right? Yes, basically. Of course, okay. because we are a streaming database, a lot of things are quite different compared mm -hmm. to like a relational database. Yeah. Um, but, but still the look and feel is pretty much the same. Okay. Very interesting. Cool. So yeah, I think the background is pretty clear, like why KSQL or KSQL DB exists and why it was changed. So let's move on to, you know, uh, the, the architecture. So if I look at the high level components of KSQL, uh, sorry, yeah, KSQL DB, uh, what are the key components and where does Kafka streams, uh, lie in that architecture? Yeah, I mean, overall, it, it's built very similar to a to, to database, I would say. Um, yeah. So you deploy KSQL DB as a fleet of KSQL DB servers, mm -hmm. the former cluster, um, and you can, can in interact with any of those, those servers. So when you start up your KSQL DB client, you connect to one of those servers, yeah. and then you, you, know, you issue your SQL. Yeah. Um, the SQL is, is parsed, you know, um, and then Finally, depending on the query type, as I just said, compiled down into a query. Mm -hmm. And we have like different different backends to, to execute those queries. So the most prominent thing is that we compile it down into a Kafka Streams application. Mm -hmm. um, and then this Kafka Streams application is, is executed on those servers. Okay. Um, so the tricky part here is of course how you how you distribute it. Um, and we can we can go into the details here, of course. Um, we also have like a, a catalog, like any other database. So you basically have your regular, uh, DDL statements where you say, create stream, create table, you give it a schema definition. So statements usually work over, a, over, a, over a, an already existing topic. You yeah. basically say, I have a topic with data in it. Um, and I say, I want to process this data, let's say as a stream and I say, create stream, uh, give my schema definition. Um, and after I have this, then I can start to query the data that is in the topic. Or I actually say, this data is actually kind of a change log of a table. 
And then I would say create table instead of create stream. And then I get those update semantics based on the key that is in the record. And then we process this more like in a, in a, in a table fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so set us the, the two main things. Um, what we also do is actually we, we integrate KSQL DB with Confluent Schema Registry. Mm -hmm. So if your data is using Schema Registry and you have data like an Afro format or JSON schema or protobuf, then we actually can pull the schema from Schema Registry when you do your create table or create stream statement. So you don't mm -hmm. have to specify the schema, but you just pull it in ah, okay. um, and create it automatically. Um, and in the, in the latest version of KSQL DB, we actually also integrate it with Kafka Connect. So if you have a, have a Connect color cluster running, um, you can also run it in embedded mode inside the SQL DB server. So then you can actually also start connectors uh, to pull in data into Kafka directly. Yeah. Uh, and the idea is to really to give people this kind of end-to-end -end experience where you know SQL DB is the, the single you know entry point into the Kafka ecosystem. If, mm -hmm. if we can do that. Um, and then you can pull in external data and then the Kafka, and then you create streams and tables on top of that, and then you, you process the data. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much the, the, the main components. Um, query parser, catalog, schema registry integration. Um, we also support UDFs. Um, mm -hmm. So you can also write your own UDFs in Java yeah. and upload them uh, and make them available. Um, and yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty much like like a database. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned some of the terms, uh, which I'm I'm actually familiar in in Kafka streams world. Maybe they are same, uh, but I just wanted to clarify. So you said streams and tables, and then there is something called as materialized views as well. So what is the difference? Like, so a stream is just like an append only log of data, right? And what is the ta what is a table then? Is it just that it's persisted in on disk, or what is the difference uh, between a stream and a table? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit tricky, and it also goes a little bit back to the to, to the history of of KSQL DB, and we also changed a couple of things. Um, so actually, also in in Kafka streams, we have those abstractions of K stream and a K table, right? Yeah, and well, a case stream is actually very simple to understand. Well, you have your topic, you know, every record is considered a new event. Hmm. Uh, and the case stream is basically a topic with a schema, if you wish. Okay. And so KSQL DB inherits this concept where we call a stream. So we just drop the K, yeah. you say create stream. You do the schema definition, it's, you know, defined over a topic. And mm -hmm. then you get the exact same behavior. Um, K tables is a, is a little bit more tricky. Um, so even in, in Kafka streams, a K table has a little bit of a, of a dual thing. Mm. So conceptually a K table in its, in its rawest form is actually just an abstraction over a topic, but instead of saying the topic stores events that are facts, we basically say the topic is a change log. Okay. So you have your value pairs in your topic. And so what you basically say, if we see a record with the same key, to a previous record, mm. we treat it as a replacement of the old record with this, with this key. Okay. So for example, if you, if you do an aggregation and you would say, you know, count by key, mm. if you have a stream and you get two records with the same key, the result is two for the key. Yeah. But if you have a K table, the result is always one because mm. if the second record comes in, it replaces the first one. So yeah. the count doesn't change. We only have seen one record for this key because it's treated as an update. Okay. Um, and this can still be stateless, right? It's just like the topic, yep. we query it, uh, we read the data and that's it. But then there's this like of second component where we say, well, very often what we actually want to do, we want to materialize the data mm. into a state store and we use RocksDB in Kafka streams by default for that. And, and then of course we would actually say, well, we put the data into RocksDB and for every update, well, we just update RocksDB. And yep. then instead of having this notion of a change log, you basically get this notion of a current snapshot of your table data. Okay. Um, and so there's this, this, this dual thing. And then, then going back to the history, so originally in, in, in KSQL, we did the exact same thing. We had create stream, we had create table statement. And the create table statement was really meant to, to define a schema over a topic, plus tells the system mm -hmm. it should process the data as a changelog. But it was a pure okay. DDL statement 
you did not pull any, any data into CSQL DB or something like that, um, and there was no rocks DB. Okay. Now, of course, a lot of people using CSQL DB, and especially with pull queries, they have a different expectation now because they say, well, if I say create table, I actually want CSQL DB to proactively pull the query into CSQL DB servers, put it mm -hmm. into rocks DB, and make the, the data queryable for me. Okay. Um, and that is something CSQL DB now supports also. And for backwards compatibility reason, what we what we, we changed the syntax a little bit. So if you, if you still do a create table statement in CSQL DB, you still have the old behavior where you say you know just create the schema and don't do anything else. But okay. then what we also added is we created the create source table statement. Hmm. And if you say create source table, then what CSQL DB actually does is says well I create a rocks DB in my CSQL DB servers. And I start to pull in the data from the changelog topic and put into RocksDB. And now you can start to query the table directly like in a database. Okay. So, so this table good. thing is this kind of dual where you have the changelog yeah. and you have the RocksDB. And it always depends a little bit, you know, how you want to work with the data. If thinking about it in a changelog way or in a, in a state way is, is a better abstraction for you. But it's always yeah. this dual thing. Yeah, I think I think I understand that part. Uh, I'm just a little bit more curious to you know understand. So there is these two things as you mentioned, like create stream and create source table, for example, because create table is kind of just to support the legacy use case, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so let's let's compare create stream and create table. So when I say create stream, it is not actually creating a rocks TV uh, table and getting data from Kafka and storing it there. It is more like a uh, like getting the data from Kafka uh, when I execute the query. Is that correct or? Yes, that's correct. So, so KSQL DB okay. and also KSQL basically uses Kafka as its backend for, to store data. Okay. So data that is pulled into KSQL DB itself um, is always considered ephemeral. It's never the source of truth. So even okay. if you say create source table, we pull it into RocksDB into the KSQL DB servers, but the source mm -hmm. of truth is still the back in Kafka cluster. It yep. also means if we, if you lose the KSQL DB server, we can still rebuild from Kafka because I mean, yep. in Kafka, the topic is stored reliably, hopefully with replication all this yep. kind of things. Um, in yep. KSQL DB, we won't replicate it necessarily. Okay. Um, okay. And so you can think of this more like of, of building an index. Hmm. So you use RocksDB okay. to basically build an index on the primary key, because if you say, you know, look up, a, uh, do a lookup query and give me a single row, if we only have the data in the changelog topic, we can't yeah. really execute this query efficiently, right? We would need to scan the yeah. whole topic. But if you have the yeah. RocksDB, we have the latest snapshot, just to look up into RocksDB, we use it as an index, and then we can answer your query basically in millisecond yeah. response time. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, so that's a that's a good analogy. So, so the source of truth is still the Kafka topic, which is the change log topic. But you can create an index just for faster access to the data. Otherwise, you need to uh, scan the entire change log topic, as you mentioned. Uh, and that makes sense. There was, if I remember correctly, in working with Ktable uh, APIs on Kafka streams, there is a way to, uh, you know, configure the values like how many like last uh, n values I can store for a particular key. So is is it also possible with Kafka, uh, sorry, KSQL uh, tables? I'm not sure what you mean with, with this feature and Kafka streams. Uh, I mean, if you say create, um, if you say the streams builder in Kafka streams, right? And you yeah. say it's builder.table, then we do the same thing here. We, we might materialize it or not. That depends. You can also force the materialization when you okay. deploy a Kafka program, but then it would read the whole changelog topic um, yeah. and put all the data into RocksDB. Yeah. But but for a particular key, uh, can it only I, keeps can the I latest configure value. only the latest? Only okay. the latest, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I cannot version based on, you know, what was the previous value and all that. Not like at the moment. the last. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you, you could build it manually if you want to. Yeah. But actually we have, we have a kip at the moment that is going to add exactly this feature. Okay. Um, what we called version state stores. Yeah. Um, so the KIP is already approved in Kafka. Um, okay. And so we're going to start implementing this in, in, in January. 
uh, and yeah. then hopefully ship with the, with the next release. And then we basically give you this ability to say, based on time, um, you know, store for every key the history of the last five minutes or 10 minutes or hour or whatever. Okay. Um, but then you don't have to do anything manually. So the system takes care of that. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then I, I, we might have done it manually. Uh, I, I might have, you know, uh, remembered it incorrectly that it was supported by K table. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we kept like last three or four values just for delayed uh, data that might come up to handle some use cases. But yeah, that's interesting to know. And then, so, okay. So we, I know the difference between streams and tables also in the domain of KSQL DB. What are materialized views? Is it the same thing as a table? It's also materialized in a rocks DB uh, table or it's slightly different? No, it, it's basically the same thing. And as a matter okay. of fact, in KSQL DB at the moment, we don't really have the syntax of create materialized view. Um, we just call it create table as select. Okay. okay. Um, but it is effectively the same as a materialized view. Um, mm -hmm. So the result will be will be a table. So there will be a rocks DB, and the query you execute is basically continuously maintaining this result table or materialized view. Okay. So whenever input data changes, you know we have a Kafka streams program running in the background, um, and so the Kafka streams program basically maintains the rocks DB for every input record. It flows through this program and updates the rocks DB immediately, mm -hmm. um, and I think the only difference at the moment is that a materialized view technically should be read only, meaning only the, the query that is actually maintaining the materialized view is allowed to, to modify it. In case equal DB at the moment, because we use the create table syntax, that's not the case. So you mm -hmm. could actually in, issue an insert into statement, but of course it kind of breaks your view, so you shouldn't do that. Um, and so that's actually something we, we, we discussed in the past to say, Hey, maybe we should really change the syntax to create materialized view as select, and then really okay. make it read only and don't allow insert into statements, um, to, yeah. you know, tighten the screws and make it safer to use. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that makes sense. Uh, okay. So I think it's pretty clear. So what's happening, uh, just, just to validate my understanding, uh, let me know if there is something off. So basically, uh, it's still Kafka streams uh, built on top of Kafka streams. And uh, as a as a developer, as a user, I just write. So I, I have to know my Kafka topic, right? Like, uh, I, I want I have to know that source of the data. And then so I can create a stream from that table, or, or not table from that topic, or I can create a materialized view or a table uh, from that topic. Uh, when the data isn't changing too often, I think table might make more sense because it will be faster to query. If my uh, data is changing more often, maybe it makes sense to directly, you know, use the interactive queries or the streams instead of having it materialized. Uh, and then as a user, I'm just writing this SQL query and everything like the creation of streams application and, you know, consumption of or reading the whole entire change log topic is happening automatically. So what kind of application does it create? So it does it reuse that application if I fire similar query again and again, or it creates a new application. So I, I just trying to understand, uh, you know, when I run the same query again, is it the same application which is running in the background if there's no change at all? And how does this mapping happens uh, between a query and a streams application. Yeah. Um, so um, to, to go back to the use cases, right, you mentioned before. So I think the, the main distinction between a stream and a table is really if you say, you know, do I really have, it, it's a semantic question. Is the yeah. data really a change log or yeah. is it is an append only event stream? Uh, and of course, KSQL DB can't really verify anything, right? So if you have an actual event stream and you say create table, SQL DB yeah. would just accept it and process the data. Uh, and there are always cases where you can bend the one and the other, depending what you want to do. But, mm -hmm. but one thing you have to keep in mind is, so if you create a table, first of all, and that is something SQL DB can enforce, you do need to have a key in your data. Yeah. So if you really have a topic where the key is null, what a lot of people also do for streams, yeah. then you cannot create a table of it because there's no primary key. Okay. 
Uh, so yeah. that's a limitation in case equally be every table needs a primary key. Yeah. The other thing is if you do have an event stream, but every event has a unique ID. Well, if you create a table of it, what would happen is KSQLDB would continue to read the, the topic and it would just insert new data into RocksDB over and over and over again, right? And mm -hmm. so eventually what you do is you basically fill up the local disk of your KSQLDB server and then eventually you will crash your system. Yeah. Because you don't have update semantics, right? Yeah. And the table never deletes anything, right? Because if you have this event stream with append only, then every record yeah. is basically an insert into the table. Yeah. And that's something okay. you actually don't want to do. So you have to, you have to know your data a little bit here, right? Um, yeah. Because otherwise you might blow your system. Yeah. And that is also the reason why if you do create stream, we never pull in anything into KSQLDB because we know it's unbounded. Mm. And of course, in the Kafka side, we know the topic has retention and stuff like that, and we don't have to worry about unbounded growth. Yeah. But if yeah. you would pull it in into something in the KSQLDB server, we need to worry about that. So we don't do it. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting point. So if you don't give uh, a key for your data uh, and you end up creating, let's say, a create table, uh, every new uh, change log or the event on the Kafka topic will end up you know, inserting a new row. Yeah, a new I mean, technically in KSQLDB, it's not possible because um, KSQLDB forces you to specify a okay. primary key column. And we will always look into the key field yeah. in the record. And if the key field is null, we just say, hey, this record is invalid and we drop it on the floor. Okay. Um, so you can't actually do it if you don't have it. But what, yeah. what, what some people have is, let's say, you know, say they have events and then, you know, so, so, so basically the key domain is changing um, because, you know, over time you create new IDs for events and whatever, um, mm. but you never have anything what in Kafka is called a tombstone, right? So you never delete anything. Yeah. And then you table just grows in case equal DB and then, then eventually yeah. it breaks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting use case. And uh, I mean, not, not use case, but a, but a case where, which uh, every developer should, you know, focus on and yeah. uh, not to do this mistake. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, that's but it's important. good that there's safety nets. Yeah. Um, cool. So I think it makes sense. So we have a, a change log topic with some retention, let's say seven days, one month, uh, whatever uh, makes sense for your data. And then uh, you have a case equal DB, uh, which is just a server running uh, in front of your Kafka cluster, uh, just to get the data, either store it in a kind of an index, which is the table or the materialized view, or directly, you know, uh, using the interactive query. So that, that makes sense. And uh, I want to understand, you know, a rocks DB is particularly used a lot, you know, even in Kafka streams and now in case equal DB. So just, just curious to know, like what, uh, what, what were the, you know, considerations while, you know, thinking about rocks DB and versus some other type of database and also, uh, just the key value type of data model that we have. So I was imagining if, uh, it was like a like a streams application, which is uh, consuming the entire change log topic. And there's a, uh, you know, a schema for every data. Can we also model it in a relational way? And can we use, let's say a MySQL DB, for example, or, or, a, or a different version of MySQL, uh, which is maybe based on rocks DB, something like my rocks. Uh, so is it also, uh, you know, possible or even given a thought about it or why was RocksDB uh, chosen, basically? Yeah, um, I mean, that actually predates my work on Kafka Streams. Um, okay. But from from what I know, RocksDB was was one of multiple options. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, also in the past, we did discuss if we want to, you know, add a different state back in Kafka Streams. Uh, for example, LNDB was discussed at some point. Um, and okay. in Kafka Streams, as a matter of fact, the interface itself is pluggable. So if you really want to plug in something else, you can just implement the corresponding interface at Java, from Java, yeah. and plug in your, your own thing. And people have done this. So there's one prototype where somebody plugged in a MongoDB under the hood. Oh, um, wow. so, so that is possible, obviously. Um, okay. for, for Kafka Streams itself, it was, of course, a very good fit to use RocksDB because Kafka has a key value model and 
Mm. RocksDB also has a Kigali model and RocksDB has a lot of advantages. I mean, you know, using the LSM tree, it has very good write performance, you know, and stuff like that. Um, very high performance database. So, so it was just a good choice for us. Um, yeah. And KSQL DB basically just inherits it. Um, and in KSQL DB, we just never made it pluggable. So you just have to live with RocksDB as a default. Um, yeah. Conceptually, you could do it, but um, we never invested in it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, RocksDB, I think performance wise, specifically the right performance. Uh, I was listening to some podcast. I don't remember the exact details, but RocksDB is really performant and, you know, it uses the the full power of SSDs. It's how yeah. it was, uh, you yeah, know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, LSM trees are very fascinating. Um, so yeah. um, if, if you don't know about this, you know, um, you, should, you, should, you should Google for that and, you know, get some, get yeah. some, get some insight in that. Um, and, and performance absolutely. is super important. I mean, that is actually also something we, we know from, from early days of Kafka streams where people said, well, you know, I have my Kafka streams application and then I want to sync my final result into a, to a relational database or something like that. But data in Kafka is so fast and also Kafka streams is so fast using RocksDB that some people actually build applications that DDoS their own database. Mm. So using something like RocksDB is actually very critical for us because we have these high performance use cases. Um, yeah. And if you use something that cannot keep up, you know, you would actually limit the throughput of your, of your program. Makes sense. And uh, my next question is all, all, almost all on the similar lines. So uh, as, a, as a developer on Kafka streams, uh, whenever we have, so we have, let's say a Kafka topic, it has, let's say hundred partitions. I write a streams application and uh, I, as a developer, make this choice, you know, how many uh, consumer threads I, I want to have. And, you know, uh, depending on how fast do I want to uh, stream the data and what is the scale of the data and all that. Uh, with KSQL DB, do I have that choice or does it do it, you know, automatically based on, you know, some heuristics? Yeah, um, it's, it's more limited in KSQL DB. Um, and it's actually a very, very interesting model. So by default, what is happening is the following. You, you issue your query um, to one of those servers, right? So server is parsing yeah. SQL. Um, it is, you know, verifying that all the column exists on the catalog and, you know, it does all the query parsing. Um, and then it compiles it down into a Kafka Streams application eventually. And when we have this plan, what we call a physical plan, then what's actually happening is um, this server is writing the plan into a so-called command topic. So KSQLDB okay. is creating a special topic, the command topic. And this command topic is the source of truth of all statements that are basically, or commands that are running in the KSQLDB server. Hmm. Um, and it's very important that this topic is single partitioned because this gives us an order of execution of different commands. Right? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the plan of the Kafka Streams application is written into the command topic. And now all KSQL DB servers of the cluster by actually reading this topic. So they now receive the plan, create a Kafka Streams application, and actually start and deploy it inside the yeah. server. And so basically all the servers are executing such queries. So they all use the same application ID now for per, per query, what we call a query ID now in KSQL DB, yeah. but it compiles down to the application ID slash group ID. And so they all spin up the Kafka Streams application and then let's say you have a KSQL DB cluster of four servers and you have a topic with eight partitions, then each of those would most likely process two of those partitions. So okay. your query is really executed in the whole KSQL DB cluster yeah. um, in a distributed manner, similar to Kafka Streams application. But yeah. as an, a writer of a query, you don't really care, worry about it, right? To you, mm -hmm. the KSQL DB cluster it, it looks like one unit I submit my query, it's running there, and how it's really you yeah. know, distributed inside the cluster, well, I don't care. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, coming to a previous point, I, I don't remember if we uh, discussed that in, in depth, uh, but you know, if I write the same query ag again and again, does it map to the same, uh, let's say, application ID or the group ID? Is it is there a cache uh, to you know figure out? Oh, this is the same query, and I ha already have an application running for this. Yeah, no, there's no such thing. Um, okay. But but the point is really, you know, if you when you run your 
your your persistent queries, what we call them. So if you say yeah. create stream as select or create table as select, and you create yeah. those like materialized views or or persistent queries, then well, they are deployed via this command topic mechanism inside the database. Uh, and so you can always say, you know, list me all running queries. So you can inspect what's running. And those queries, you know, say are there forever. So they will never stop running until you explicitly say terminate query by ID. Or if you say drop table. So if I say create table as select, and then you say a drop table, then the corresponding query would be would okay. be would be terminated in the back end, in the background. Okay. And that that okay. is really, really, really different to a database because if you're sitting in front of your of your terminal, right? And you do create table. Um, usually, this is a command that is you know executed once and then it's done. Mm. Even if you yeah. do a create table as select, because it basically says, well, I create an initial basically dump of data, I put it into the table, but then the table is not modified anymore. But in our case, if you do create table as select, it's more like create materialized view as select with continuous updating of the result while the query is running in the background and it's running forever. And here yeah. also this command topic we, we, we mentioned before comes into place, right? So if, mm. if a SQL DB server crashes and it restarts, it actually rereads the command topic and it will restart the query, you know, and, and help again to, to process the query. So it's also fully for tolerant. So even if, and even if you stop your full SQL DB cluster and stop all servers and you restart them, you know, all your, your persistent queries will continue to run again. So they will start up again. Yeah. So it's the only... Okay. You can only stop a persistent query by explicitly issuing a drop table for this output table. Or if you say each query has an ID and you say, you know, terminate query. Um, and so if you issue the same query a second time, you don't really compare anything. Then you just, you know, do the same computation twice and you get a second result table with a, with a different name, but the same content. Um, yeah. Because we don't even want to distinguish that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um... I want to move a little bit to the infra side. Uh, so let's say I'm on the data infra team and I have, you know, a Kafka cluster uh, managing the brokers and there are hundreds of topics, right? How does it map to the KSQL DB server? Is it like similar size cluster that I want to have for KSQL DB? Uh, as a data infra team, how do I figure out, you know, what are my uh, capacity requirements, for example? Yeah. Yes, so, so, so it really, really depends on, on, on the workload you want to do. Um, yeah. So let's say you have, a, you have a huge Kafka cluster, 20 servers yeah. or something like that. Um, but you actually say, hey, I have, I have a small you know, use case and I have those five topics that I'm only interested in. Mm -hmm. So maybe deploying like a SQL DB cluster with like two or three servers for, for tolerance is totally sufficient and you're fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you could have a small Kafka cluster with, with four servers only, but you do really a lot of heavy processing, right? Then yeah. you could also need like a SQL DB cluster of 10 servers because your queries yeah. are just very, very heavy load, right? And I mean, Kafka is yeah. very efficient to serve data, right? And that is the only thing Kafka does. Even if you write like a hundred queries against it, a topic, you know, Kafka just says, yeah. well, that's a hundred consumer groups and it just serves the data and I don't care. Kafka can handle it. So, so, yeah. so it really depends on how many queries you're doing and how heavy those queries are. And I mean, you can imagine if you say, I have a simple filter query that is mm. quite lightweight, but if you do aggregations yeah. or joins or stuff like that, yeah. then of course those queries become more heavyweight. And so, so it's very, very hard to tell as, as upfront um, what, what, you, what you have. And then of course, yeah. the other point is besides compute, also how many tables do you create in your SQL DB server? Because you need yeah. corresponding storage space, right? And so yeah. you need to basically estimate your key cardinalities and how big a row is. And then you can, you know, estimate how many SQL DB servers you need to shard out the data across the, the cluster to be able to store mm. all those data in RocksDB. Yeah. Similar to sizing a Kafka Streams application. But now, of course, you need to do it on a, on a cluster level where you, you know, cluster need to level. reason about um, how many how many queries you, you can deploy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a good thing, actually, because uh, imagining like an organization where there is a central team who manages, you know, everything related to Kafka, they can do the capacity estimations and, you know, create a cluster for both Kafka and KSQL DB, but individual product teams, they don't need to care about, you know, uh, what kind of application or what kind of 
deployments do I need and what kind of machines do I need and all that, right? So it's yeah. it's kind of abstracted away from them. Exactly. Of course, they they want to consult with the data infra because uh, before running, you know, some heavy workloads, but it's still better than you know managing and estimating our own yeah. applications. Now, what do you, what, um, what have you seen in practice? So what a lot of people do because you know yeah. this, this estimation of, of sizing a SQL DB cluster is very very complicated. Um, yeah. So what what most people actually do is instead of having one very big SQL DB cluster, they just deploy multiple. So you yeah. could say, hey, I have my application team one, and I give them a SQL DB cluster, and I work with them because they know their query workload to size it. And then there's yeah. this other data infra uh, data science team that also want to do that. They get their own mm. SQL DB cluster. Yeah. And then you basically okay. break it down into smaller chunks that you can can more easily manage. And that is also yeah. what we see a lot in, in, in Confluent Cloud. So I have to make a small product pitch here. So <laughs> in, uh, in Confluent, we, we host KSQL DB as fully managed service. Yeah. And here we actually also talk very often about a KSQL DB application. What basically means okay. one KSQL DB cluster for this the purpose to serve one particular use case. And there can be you know multiple queries in this cluster, um, but it's basically one domain that I want to isolate from other domains. Yeah. That that's a good point. Uh, I mean, I can imagine certain different uh, workloads uh, being run by a product team versus an analytics team. They might have you know long running jobs. They might need some higher retention on their topics and on their data and whatnot. So yeah, that's a that's a good use case. Uh, exactly once. So since it's again Kafka streams, how does exactly once semantics uh, you know come into the picture? Uh, last time, I think we when we discussed, there was a topic. Uh, so maintaining a K table state uh, in a in a stream application, and then exposing that state on a REST API, that was not supporting exactly once, right? Is it the same case with KSQL DB somehow, or it's already supporting exactly once? No, it's the exact same thing. Um, and okay. so and that goes back to what we what we discussed already, where we have those different query types. We have some yeah. persistent queries and we have pull queries. And pull mm. queries go against RocksDB. So basically it's it's an SQL implementation or an SQL interface on top of this REST API, right? That you could build manually. Yeah. In our case, the KSQL DB server just implements this API for you. So you write your mm. SQL statement, we now compile it down into a, to a different program, not a Kafka Streams application. Um, we we have this kind of you know endpoints exposed inside KSQL DB. We know where the different shards of the rocks DB live. You know we distribute yeah. the query out, then we basically get the result back, um, and then we give it to 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 your user. And here again, if you have exactly once enabled, then at the moment you would still also query uncommitted data. So mm -hmm. the same problem exists, um, and it does not make sense to solve this problem at the KSQL DB layer, right? Um, yeah, and that's, 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 a, that's a philosophy we always followed for the whole Kafka stack. Um, yeah. Also, when I worked on Kafka Streams, very often it's kind of, oh, we have this problem, you know, well, you could put a workaround into Kafka Streams, but actually it's much better to, to change the consumer client, for example. So then yeah. you basically talk to the client's team and say, hey, fix it there. Why should we put a workaround in here? And same yeah. now we're doing KSQL DB and we contribute a lot to, to, to Kafka, right? Because KSQL DB yeah. obviously is not part of Apache Kafka. It's, it's a conference project. Then yeah. we would say, hey, we don't want to fix it on KSQL DB. We rather make a change proposal to Kafka. Um, that would also benefit Kafka users, obviously. We never would push anything that, 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 is, that is not useful there. Um, and then we fix it on the right layer. Or we even go, go down to the broker level where it's kind of, hey, you know, that, that should be fixed on the broker level. That's the right layer. Um, and not, you know, build workarounds on higher layers. And so KSQL yeah, that, DB that... just waits for the fixing Kafka streams. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I was trying to, you know, fig figure out, you know, uh, if it would make sense. And I think that's the exact use case, you know, it's the same component, the same limitation, and it's been, you know, uh, carried uh, along with KSQL DB as well. And if one problem fix uh, will, you know, fix both the use cases, exactly. like writing our own uh, and KSQL DB. So I think that that makes sense. Um, Talking about the use cases, so typically what I've seen is, so there is so many, you know, data systems which people want to query on, uh, one like Kafka, there's S3, there's, you know, some other databases. There are user interfaces that, uh, uh, that are exposed, uh, SQL-like queries. Uh, but as a 
as a let's say data analyst or as a developer as a product manager there are different people querying this data right so uh, wh what i want to ask is uh, here it doesn't seem like it is like all the details are abstracted away from the person who is writing the sql queries so they know that oh, okay it's backed up by a kafka topic it is it has this much retention and all that uh, versus some other uh, products where it's you know abstracted away where the data is coming from you just write your sql query you know the table structure and no matter it is coming from s3 some data partially is coming from somewhere else and you get like a unified view of that but here it's more like you know you know all a lot of details about kafka topics and all that so who is it for is it for developers is it also for non developers let's say uh, what is the primary use case you have seen yeah so, so currently it i would say it's mainly used by, by developers still um mm -hmm. but yes the goal is absolutely to make this easier to use and yeah to make kafka more and more an implementation detail Hmm. Um, it's just a, just a very long, long road to go. That, 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 that's the yeah. problem. And it also goes back a little bit to the history. So, you know, as I mentioned, originally we started KSQL as an SQL layer. So this was really yeah. targeted for, for, for application developers, for Kafka people, right? And this pivot to KSQL DB was also decided to say, well, we actually also want to, want to be attractive for non-Kafka people. Um, hmm. but of course. The streaming database is so different. A lot of you know Kafka abstractions leak into KSQL DB, um, and it's very hard to to actually you know abstract it away completely. Um, yeah. And so we're still working on that. We're getting better, but it's just like a very very long road to 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 ink to to, to iron out all the all the, all the kinks um, that, that we have. Yeah. Um, and, and in the end, I mean, we have to be fair. Kafka is Kafka. And if you query that in Kafka, I think there will always be some level of understanding you need to have if you work with it. Um, I think it's it's pretty pretty hard to abstract it away completely, um, even if we yeah. if we try to do that. Um, and as I mentioned, for example, we have already this integration with Confluent uh, with Kafka Connect, um, where you can you know connect, point to Connect cluster, you spin up things, and if you push this further, right, then you could say, well, maybe at some point you can really issue a query against data that might live in an S3 and can SQL DB automatically yeah. spins up a connector in the background and send us the processing mm -hmm. and you don't even know about it. Um, okay. In cloud, of course, it's a little bit more tricky because it's also a cost question. If you spin up a connector, yeah. you know, in cloud, you would be charged for that. So, I mean, that's an, you know, question of, uh, is a user even allowed to do that or stuff like that? Um, but, but some people actually, you know, have this vision to say, you know, Kafka could become this kind of a data lake thing where, you know, all yeah. those things just fall into part, but that's of course a very long shot. Um, and let's see how far we can push that. Yeah. Uh, we, we already talked about one limitation, which is exactly one's, uh, semantics, and that is not a limitation. It's just not implemented yet. It will be done in future. Uh, but yeah, it is currently a limitation. Are there more limitations to using KSQL DB? Uh, with this, I want to also ask, you know, what is the right use case where I should think about KSQL DB versus Kafka Streams application? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so in general, um, KSQL DB is of course limited in what kind of data it can process. Yeah. Because in the end, you need data that fits into a flat schema even if you allow some, mm. some nested schemas with structs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And KSQL DB also integrates with a fixed number of data formats. So we support mm. JSON, Afro, Protobuf, um, some CBS format that is used once in a while, and then the plain Kafka format. So if you just have a string key or something like that, with the regular yeah. Kafka serializers, we can read it. But let's yeah. say you have, let's say something exotic, XML data. SQL DB can't read it because it's not integrated yeah. or you name your arbitrary data format, right? Um, then, then you're limited in Kafka streams, obviously, because you can always implement the custom serializer. You can work with any data. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the first thing. Um, another thing is, and we also see this in, in Kafka streams. In Kafka streams, we do expose two different APIs. We have the higher level DSL, and yeah. we have the lower level processor API. 
And why do we have the processor API? Well, because the DSL is a higher level abstraction and it is a little bit less flexible. And now you put SQL on top of that, that is even more less flexible than the programming API, right? Yeah. So you just lose flexibility of the tool. Um, yeah. So, and, and that's always the thing, you know, people of, often ask, you know, when should I use which tool? And I always say, use the tool with the highest level of abstraction if it works for you. Yeah. And if it starts to break because you need to do something that you just cannot express, fall down to the next lower level. And so in, in Kafka, if you really say, technically, you could even talk about like four different layers here. You have KSQL DB as declarative SQL on top. Then you have Kafka Streams DSL. Then you have Kafka Streams Processor API. And then there are even use cases where this is not flexible enough. And then you fall back to the consumer and produce them manually. And it's really interesting. Pick, pick whatever tool is best for you, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, yeah, you you need to know what kind of use case you're trying to solve. It's if it's a very simple use case where KSQL DB fits really well, you don't have you you don't need a lot of flexibility. Go for exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, if you really need some flexibility, some tweaks here and there with Kafka Streams, uh, then Kafka Streams would be a you know good use case. Yeah. And as you said, even further, you can just go and, you know, work with low level consumers yeah. and producer API, which is also, uh, you know, depends yeah. on your use case. So, so. so one, one very good use case where, where we have seen KSQL be used very often um, is to just say, I want to basically filter data in one topic and put a subset of the data into a different topic. Yeah. Very okay. simple use case. You know, you do your create stream statement, you do your simple select query creates this output stream that is written into a different topic and you're done. And you don't need yeah. to worry about anything, right? I mean, yeah. it's also very simple to do the same thing with Kafka streams, you know, yeah. but why would you write Java code and deploy your application if you just write an SQL query, right? That's right. That's right. A similar thing what we have seen very often is this, um, and to, 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 to put a little bit more on that, so that is actually a feature that a lot of people use to implement server-side filtering. So very often, you know, you have a consumer application that wants to read data from a Kafka topic, but Kafka itself does not support broker side filtering, right? Hmm. So the consumer would need to read all data and then filter on the client. And especially when you're in a cloud environment, right? With like, you know, network costs and stuff like that, that could be very expensive. So what people often yeah. do is to say, well, I actually use a KSQL DB that is running close to the broker, so network traffic is much cheaper. I just yeah. do the filtering, put it into the top topic, and then let my consumer read this result topic. And then I have yeah. server-side filtering inside the cloud infrastructure. But when I cross the cloud boundaries, you know, and go to my client, I don't have to worry about huge traffic and do, do client-side mm -hmm. filtering. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing, for example. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, of course, a lot of people do really like expensive you now data pipelines with aggregations and joins and data preparation and stuff like that using KSQL DB. So just express it, you run it, yeah. and you get your result topic. And then finally, you use some Kafka Connect to sync it to MongoDB or some S3 or whatever you want to use, um, mm -hmm. and then 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 do do do, do serving. So what is, what is not a good yeah. use case, for example, in KSQL DB, because we're just talking about like syncing result data, um, yeah. is, is ad hoc analytic queries. Mm -hmm. So if you really like a data scientist and you play around with, with, with your data, right, um, then KSQL DB is not a good fit. So we, we don't really yeah. support indices. So we only have tables uh, in, indexed by the primary key. We don't have secondary yeah. indices. Um, and if you, if you want to express those very expensive ad hoc queries, SQL DB is just not built for that. Then, you know, yeah. if you want to do some, some pre-aggregation, some denormalization using SQL DB in a streaming fashion, do that, but then lend your data in whatever MongoDB, relational database, Pino, whatever you want, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, then do your talk interactive, you know, data exploration stuff there, because that is not what, what SQL DB is built for. Yeah, that makes sense. So KSQL DB is still, you know, uh, very closely related to the streams use case and not like a entire, like a full fledged database where you have secondary indexes and all the other indexes. You just want to query based on the primary key and that's it. Yeah, exactly. It's all, the value is pretty opaque for you. You don't have the visibility in, inside the value. Yeah. 
uh, and that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, there are different tools. You can do that, so we don't, we don't, yeah. we don't, we don't prohibit this. Um, but the point is really, if you query and you don't have a primary key, it basically results in a table scan. Yeah, and we know Absolutely. all the table scans are just very, very expensive. Uh, I mean, like you mentioned, someone uh, used MongoDB. So MongoDB supports second indexes. So definitely it is it is possible to build something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, case SQL DB does not provide that exactly. feature because exactly. it's built for the different use case. Yeah, uh, yeah so, uh, sounds very good. Uh, and so uh, talking about the operations, I think there are no limitations, right? Like whatever is possible with streams in general, like joins and window operations and different types of windows, it's all possible with uh, KSQL DB as well. And uh, so if we if we compare the feature set of Kafka streams versus feature set of KSQL DB, is it still, you know, uh, trying to match up or it's already, you know, matching with, with the Kafka streams API? No, um, so everything we have basically in the, in the DSL, we also have in, in KSQL DB. So there are, there are no okay. limitations. So we okay. support all the aggregations, windowing, all the joins we support there. Um, what of course also means there are limitations in KSQL DB itself, right? Because we yeah. only do the joins that Kafka Stream supports. So we only have primary key joins and foreign key joins and tables. Yeah. But we don't have a cross product, for example. Um, that's something yeah. we also thinking about adding maybe in Kafka Streams even that could, could be useful. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it comes with limitations, obviously, um, and in general, of course, KSQL DB comes with more limitations. We talked about this. Um, uh, another thing that's very powerful in Kafka streams that KSQL DB does not support is, is punctuations because it's just like very hard to express punctuations in an SQL declarative thing. Yeah. So if you have a use case where you want to wait or react to an event that does not occur, so a missing yeah. event. In Kafka streams, you can say, well, I register punctuation, you know, if the event comes, I cancel the punctuation, otherwise the punctuation fires and I can do something. In case yeah. it will be very, very hard to do. Um, but other, uh, besides that, um, everything thing we have in, in Kafka streams is there in, in case it will be. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh... Just the, so I have a, a KSQL DB application, everything is running fine. How do I test it? So for a, for a Kafka streams application, typically what I do is, you know, write kind of a end-to-end -end test uh, because I have some state. I also, let's say, update some external state, let's say a MySQL DB or something like that. So I just run like a entire end-to-end -end test. How do I make sure, or how do people typically make sure with KSQL DB that their query is correct and what they want to do is, you know, it's actually, there is no bug in the, the SQL query. Yeah, I think it's, it's similar to other databases. In the end, you, you need to run the query and then yeah. verify the results. So it's basically more like system slash integration tests that you're writing. Um, yeah. We don't have tooling at the moment. They could have like a, a lightweight, you know, test runner or something like that. So there are ideas to actually, okay. to actually build support for that. Um, but it's not out. Um, so similar in a database, right? Well, in the end, you need to have your, your yeah. test data. Maybe you have your, yeah. your, 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 your devil KSQL DB and your prod KSQL DB, and then you issue mm -hmm. queries in devil, and then you read back the result topic with some verification application you're writing um, to check if everything is in order, and eventually you, you deploy it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think uh, that's a that's a good and you know good amount of information. If we talk about KSQL DB, we started with the history and you know how it works, uh, some some uh, limitations, some use cases that that are more suitable for KSQL DB. Uh, comparison with Kafka Streams, some different concepts. Uh, so I think it's it's a lot of information, uh, and you know uh, I think we have covered a lot, and uh, it's it's really useful. Uh, for folks who want to understand and get started with KSQL DB and make the right choice, basically, because there is no perfect solution. There is, of course, more abstraction that you get, but sometimes it might be a little let, less flexible uh, uh, as compared to Kafka Streams. Uh, so yeah, I think all these uh, 
points that you made about case equal db i think it will help uh, our viewers make uh, good decisions in in terms of what should be used in which use case and not just okay case equal db is the latest so let's use that because that might have some uh, disadvantages in future if it depends on the your use case right um, so great anything you want to you wanted to add more on case equal db that we might have missed um not that i can think of um as as i said and i mean you just pointed out that i mean i think a sql db is, is a very very useful tool um but yeah i mean if you have a hammer not everything is a nail so so just use it for the things that it's built and i can't just you know not emphasize this enough a sql db even if we call it a database is a very very different beast compared to like a relational database or something like that. So a lot of things yeah. you do, you might, you know, might be surprised why it behaves differently. And the point is really because it's a streaming database or a relational database. So even if the look yeah. and feel is the same, um, don't, don't confuse it with a relational database and use it for what it's built and not, not misuse it because it would make you very unhappy. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthias. That was again a very insightful and you know interesting discussion with you. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure our viewers are going to like it. So uh, to our viewers, if you like this episode, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, connect with Matthias if you have any specific questions on case equal DB. Connect with me if you want some more interesting Kafka related topic on some other ecosystem component. And we'll be happy to do that. Um, Thanks a lot again. And, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to collaborate with you more in future. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm allowed back on the show, very happy to do that. <laughs> Kafka is a huge ecosystem, a lot of things we can talk about. And yeah. thanks again for, for having me. Awesome. Thanks.